word of hope, a call to every woman and man, a light unto the end of time. This is Al Islam. أوز بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى كل ملائكة المقربين وعلى إباد الله الصالحين برحمة الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وأصلي ونصلي على المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا إلما اللهم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وخل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this way of life for this Islam had it not been for Allah's guidance you and I would not have been in position to guide ourselves into this. And so all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the nourisher, the sustainer, the evolver, the molder, the shaper of all the worlds. May peace and blessing of Allah be upon the last and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household and companions and all those who follow him until the end of time. My dear brother Islam, I bring you greetings from Zaytun Da'awa Institute a think tank research center in Washington State, United States of America. And I'm here to deliver some few talks in Abuja. This is my first lecture, you know, in this great nation of mine, of ours, inshallah. And the topic given to me, why is the West coming towards Islam? Why is the West coming towards Islam? In spite the fact that even though Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, yet it is the most misunderstood religion in the world. So the question that intellectuals are asking is that, why is the West coming towards Islam? Well, the West is coming towards Islam because the West think, they reason, they rationalize, they process information before they accept. So the West is coming towards Islam because the West have tried so many ways of life. They've tried communism. Communism is not working, it didn't work. They've tried social system. It didn't work also. The West have tried social democratic system. It is not working. So the West is forced by natural inclination to look for the next alternative and that alternative is Islam. The West is looking for a spiritual upliftment. Materially, the West is good. When it comes to material advancement, the West is good. But spiritually, the West is bankrupt. And so that natural inborn mechanism that Allah has infused in mankind to realize the one and only God that deserves to be worshipped, which in Islam we call the fitra. That fitra is an innate, it is working. And the West is actually blind, looking for a way out spiritually. And so when they come in contact with Islam, they accepted Islam hands down. The West is coming towards Islam because Islam have the answers for the problem that is engulfing the West. See, I live in America for 32 years. I still live in America. I came last few weeks. And I travel all over the place and I deliver lecture on Islam and other religion and, you know, presenting Islam on different level. Before I begin my talks, let me give you about my wife in America, a white woman. That's my wife. Well, I used to work in a, in a, in a hospital a few years ago. I work, you know, in a hospital. And I work only in the weekends. The weekdays I go, I travel all over the place in prisons, and I deliver the talks about Islam. And so this lady was hired in the facility. I don't know. So when I came to work on Saturday, I saw a paper lying on the table in my office that a lady had been you know, uh, employed. So within a few seconds, she came in the office, and I was sitting down. 
And she asked me, are you the, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the supervisor? I said, yeah. I said, are you the new staff? She said, yes. All right. So I took her to um, where to work. I showed her what to do. Once I'm done doing that, I came to the office. As I was in the office sitting down, doing my work, she came in. When she came in, it was time for Zuhur, and I was doing my salat. I put my sajak, doing my salat in the office, and she popped in. And she saw me doing salat, going up and down, and she waited as I was praying. When I'm done with my salat, she came and she said, Mr. Muhammad. I said, yeah. She said, are you a Muslim? I said, yeah. She said, oh, Jesus love you. She said, Jesus love me. I said, I love him too. Matter of fact, if you see him, tell him I say hi. No problem. And she said, I'm serious, man. You worship Muhammad? I said, I don't worship no Muhammad. I worship Allah. Muhammad is a prophet, just like you and I. The difference is he received revelation. By virtue of that, he become the leader of mankind. That's all. But we don't worship Muhammad. And she was all over on me. So she went outside and she brought a New Testament, a small New Testament. She's trying to save my soul. She gave it to me. And in my head, I say, you don't know who you're dealing with. <laughs> if she know who she's dealing with, she wouldn't give me New Testament because it is in my head. So what happened was, I took it. I didn't say anything. So on Sunday, she came again. And she brought me a little pamphlet, you know, about Christianity and stuff. I took it. And I just laughed and I went home. The following week, you know what she told me? She said, Mr. Muhammad, I have a question for you. Matter of fact, a request. I want you to come to me to the church. I said, me, come to church? She said, yeah. I said, all right, I'll, I'll go. She said, oh, the Holy Ghost, I know the Holy Ghost. I said, right. So she know the Holy Ghost told her that I'm going to accept. So I did. And I, I dress like this all the time in America. There is wisdom in doing this. See, I dress like them, but I put my heart. So they know I'm a Muslim, but I dress like them. So all right, you know, I'm cool like that. So they accepted it. And so she told them that a big Muslim is coming to the church. So I went to the church. And the pastor was doing his thing, and I was in the front. And once the church thing is done, they gave me $200 to buy something, which, in fact, I was broke that day. You know, so I took the money, it came at the right time. I need to buy some food stuff, I'm broke. So I say, Allah, al musabbib al asbab. Allah, he does things that you don't understand. So on the way going, we went home. I dropped her off and I went home. And the following week, I said, look, I want you to come to the masjid with me. She said, no, 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 no. I can't go and pray to no masjid. I pray to, uh, to God Almighty, to Jesus. I said, well, fine. I went to the church, I didn't become a Christian. You come to the masjid. You don't have to be a Muslim. See what's going on. He said, okay, I'm going to go once. I said, just once. So she came the following week, Friday. We went to the masjid. And look at what Allah did. See, in, in our masjid, we have three imams. That is America. Imam for Tawheed. We have the imam for Hadith and Sirah. And then we have the imam people like me who specialize on comparative logic, science, and, you know, thinking stuff so that day i wasn't doing the salat it was somebody else was doing the salat but allah in his wisdom he got stuck in the traffic he couldn't come to the masjid so he was late so they came to me muhammad this is okay i do my next week i'm just, no man the guy's the guy's late so i just write something and, and i went and the ladies they stay in the back they have a big television screen they could see the imam so the lady I brought here, she was with her sisters. But she saw me all of a sudden standing to be an imam. And because of her, I said, you know what? I'm going to talk a topic, the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus. And I'm going to use the Quran, the Bible, and logic. So I use it. And mashallah, once I'm done, she came outside. Excuse me, what, were, you, were you a Christian before you became a Muslim? I said, no. I said, so how come? Oh my God. So who, who are you? I said, well, let's talk. So we talk a little bit. Well, she went home. To cut it short, within two weeks, I'm home. And the phone rang. I picked the phone. 
She said, hello, I says, wa alaikum salam. And she said, Mr. Muhammad. I said, yeah. She said, um, I want to be a Muslim. <laughs> I said, why? She said, because it makes sense. I said, what do you mean it makes sense? She said, because it makes sense. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, it just makes sense. She kept, <laughs> she kept saying that. See, that's the fitra. They don't know. That's why Allah said, you are the best of people chosen for mankind. Kuntu hayru ummat uhurjal linnas. Ta'amuruna bil ma'aruf wa tanhawna alil munkar. You, the Muslim, are the best of people chosen to lead mankind. Then Allah said, وَلَكِنَّ أَكْسَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Most of mankind, they don't know Islam. They don't know. We read this in the Quran all the time. وَلَكِنَّ أَكْسَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Most people do not know. Even though Islam is the fastest growing religion, but they don't understand Islam. They don't know what it is. They think it's bombing. They think it's all the beer. They think it's ladies covering up. They think it's all angry. That's what they think. So it's about time that we change the style of our propagation. You've got to change it, man. You should change it. Islam is soft. It's natural. It fits in any community, in any culture. That's Islam. But if you become rigid, that's when people begin to... Um, alienate themselves from Islam. So why are they coming to Islam? Because Islam have all the answers for mankind. That is why at the beginning, Allah, he said to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, قُلْ tell them, لَإِنِّي تَمْعَةُ الْإِنسُ وَلِجِنْ أَلَا أَنْ يَأَتُ بِمِسْلِ خَازَ الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأَتُونَ بِمِسْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعَضُهُمْ لِبَعَلِ زَهِيرًا If the whole of mankind and jinn were to come together to bring a book like the Quran, they will never be able to do it. Think of this ayah. We don't speak like that. No, no, man. We don't talk like this. The whole of mankind and jinn, why would Muhammad make such a huge challenge? That's a very deep and serious challenge. In other words, whosoever gave these Quranic verses have a mind that is beyond human conceptualization. Yes. Because we don't talk like that. Whole mankind and jinn. What kind of talk is that? That means it's a serious talk. The Arabs, they were listening. What did they do when this ayah came? Nothing. They say what? Waqalu la tasma uli haza al Quran wal gawfihi la alakum taglibun. They say, don't listen if Muhammad read the Quran. Make some noise in between so that you will have upper hand. That's weak argument. It's weak. They can't solve the problem. Then Allah was watching them to see if they will bring something that will supersede the Quran. They couldn't do it. Then Allah reduced it from the whole of mankind and jinn. He said, Am yakulu naftara kul fa'atu bi ashiri surin misliki muftaratu. Do they say Muhammad forged the Quran? All right. Tell them to bring ten surah, forge like the Quran, if they are speaking the truth. Did they bring it? They couldn't do it. One year before the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left the earth, Allah reduced it again. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأَعْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِسْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَىٰ أَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ سَادِكِينَ فَإِن لَنْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسَ وَالْحِجَارَةِ if you are in doubt as to the message we've given our apostle, then bring one surah this time, one, and bring your witness if you are speaking the truth. Then Allah said, you cannot do it. You will never be able to do it. If that is the case, let them prepare themselves for a fire whose fuel is men and stone. Men like Bob Marley, Michael Jackson, Madonna, these men will be fuel. They are destroying mankind, going naked, and the people are accepting it. I was giving a lecture in Ghana yesterday. This guy came into the masjid and he had his pants, you know, like this, sagging, he's walking. So I said, look, man, get out of my mask. I'm not, you can't listen to me. If you're going to dress like this, get out of my mask, man. So he left. Later he came back apologizing. I said, do you know where you get this sagging, this pant walking like this? Do you know where? He said, well, it's a, it's a style. See, I work in the prison system. I have six prisons in the United States I visit all over. 
That's my job. I travel to hospital, United States, secondary school, university. I debate. I do everything. And why this style of dress, sagging, with your pants, no belt, seeing your dirty underwear? I don't want to see no dirty underwears, but that's what they show. Where do they get it from? In the prison system. Because in America, sometimes they give you um, like 2,500 years in jail or 7,835 days and a few hours in jail or 11,000 years or one day or whatever. They do that. And so those who get like 100 days or 100 years, they can't come out. The inmates. So they don't have nothing. So the young guys that come into the prison system, they take their belt. Man, give me your belt, man. They take their belt by force. And so the guys don't have belt. So they walk like crabs. Walk like this. So that's, that's, it developed in the prison system. So when they came out, they begin to walk like this. And it became a style. And we are imbibing a subhanAllah. They are trying to put us in hellfire. They have nothing but to look for Islam. There is a man in America by the name of Jimmy Swaggart. Jimmy Swaggart is the tele-evangelist, one of the biggest evangelists in America today, Jimmy Swaggart Ministry. You know, he debated Sheikh Ahmed Didad in the year 1988, those of you who know. So Jimmy Swaggart, he wrote a book, and the book's name is The Dark Stain of American Society. The Dark Stain of American Society. In that book, Jimmy Swaggart said, America, oh America, if God did not punish you, then God must go back in time and apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, if God, God must punish America. And God, if you didn't punish America, you have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for what you did to them because America is worse. So they're looking for a way out. They don't know. Trump well, before I speak about Trump, is there any uh, CIA or FBI here? <laughs> hey, I want to be sure. I want to make sure that I'm cool. You know, I don't, I don't want to be arrested when I go back to JFK. You know, so I'll just make sure. Just raise your hand. Let me see your hand. I mean, we're not going to tell nobody. Just, just raise your hand. All right. No CIA here. That means I can talk freely. I'm home. We could talk and reason amongst ourselves. And so in America today, we buy churches, our church, our masjid today used to be a church. Huge masjid, big. The church people, they let it go because nobody's coming to church no more. People are thinking now at the age of technology, globalization, people are reasoning. So God was born by somebody else and God go to the bathroom and he eat and he was in the womb of some woman and God's Man, they can't take it no more. So most of them are becoming agnostics or gnostics or deists or atheists or free thinkers. Most of them, they are leaving the church. They're becoming free thinkers. They say, no, man, there's no God. Because if this is the story of God, how he was born, so God is a racial God, like I'm a Fulani by tribe. So God is a Jew. Why would God be a Jew? Why would God be a white man? Or a Hausa? Or Fulani? Why would God take a race? Man, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So people are realizing that and they are getting out of, people are coming out of Christendom by the tongues. And Islam is the fastest growing religion because people are looking for the way out. And so we step into the play. That is why Trump said, ban the Muslims. He didn't say ban the Jews or the Christians or the you know, Zoroastrians or the Taoism or Hinduism and Buddhism. No, the Muslims. Why? If they are talking about you, that means you are a force to reckon with. You are somebody powerful. They know you are a stumbling block. Anytime that somebody is fighting you, fighting you, check yourself. You are, you are something very special. And so that's what it is. But yet, their children are becoming Muslims. In universities, in colleges, people are coming to Islam because Islam is exposed on the internet. People go online and they check what Islam is all about. And they realize that what they hear on television, on CNBC, on CNN, and other media outlets, it is a scam. It is not true. It is some 
Why should I learn Islam from the television? Why should I learn Islam from Sheikh Google? Why? Why would I just go and learn from somebody, a Jew wrote about Islam on the internet, and I'm going to learn from that? So if you want to learn Islam, you come to the Muslim. And so we are stepping onto the play. We travel all over the place, all over the United States, across South America, even into Europe, and we present Islam. And there is no way we go and deliver a message without people turning to Islam. Sometimes in the, in the jail. We go to jail in America five times a week. They stop us from five times, they give us three times in a week. Then eventually they reduce again, now we go only twice. But everybody goes five times. So we ask why. They say, well, anytime you guys come to jail, you cause trouble. The trouble is, people are reverting to Islam. Wallahi, that's the truth. Sometimes we go to jail and people make a long line from here all the way down without even us saying nothing. So, so there's a guy who came, a white guy, big, huge, tall guy. He became a Muslim. I said, man, um, why do you want to be a Muslim? I said, well, I read so many books, man, but the Quran, man, the Quran, I'm telling you, man, yo, man, the Quran. <laughs> you know? But that's, that's, that's the truth. If Allah loves you, want to give you $10 million, He open your path and infuse Islam in it. What lie? Islam, you have to be proud. This is how I dress in America. I am proud of my religion. Because if you stop me, I can defend my religion, not fighting intellectual. I can present facts on different angles dissipate whatever they are thinking and solidify the truth of Islam. No problem at all. So I'm proud of this religion. So when he became a Muslim, he said, Sheik. You know what's Sheik? That's Sheik. Yeah. He said, excuse me, Sheik. He said, what? He said, um, I want a name. I said, okay, um, what name do you want? Um, um, I want to be called Abdul Jihad. <laughs> Abdul Jihad? The guys, he want to go, man. He just ready. I was like, man, come on, man, just tone it down. There's no Abdul Jihad, you know, Abdul Salam, Abdul Mu'min, Abdul Razak, Abdul, uh, you know. But you can Abdul Jihad is a concept in Islam, so you can't be the, the 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 servant of Jihad. I don't know where you get that from, but he just loved to be jihadist. But Islam, don't take it the way it is. So we have to recoil his ideas. Make him understand that it's jihad is a tenet of Islam. And it's a concept that we use depending on how we use it. So he understands what Islam is all about. So the people are coming to Islam. In 2013, there was a Beijing conference. I think some of you might remember. 2013. Women all over the world went to Beijing in China to address the woes of the women. They want to talk about women. And they took, they took the pilot project in Islam. They said, in Islam, you see, even women are relegated to the backdrop. Even in Salat, where it's supposed to be for God, the Islam allow women all the way in the back. See, Islam doesn't like women. They cover themselves. You see, Islam doesn't like women. Inheritance, they give the men two and the, the, the women one. You see, Islam doesn't like women. They pack out with so many you know, information, about 15 of them. So they dwell on that, and the lecture was seven days in Beijing. Women all over the world, conference. And the, the pilot project was women in Islam, the inheritance. They were saying whatever they want to say, they think they have it. But you can't be an Islamic scholar if you're not a Muslim. You should have that certain knowledge to become Islamic scholar or exegist. People are not Muslim, but they are trying to read what the Quran said, you know, without going to the background, and that's what they think. So now they say in prayers, which is supposed to be from to Allah, the women are in the back. So women don't have a position in Islam. So we answer them. I couldn't go to the conference, but I went on the internet and I wrote a very long, you know, rebuttal on that one. And among other things, I explained to the leaders of that community that. You see the reason why women are relegated to, to pray in the, back, in the backdrop with a, with a cover so they don't get the mixture. I said, before I start telling you the problems, 
that Allah, he knows already. Last year, only last year, the Vatican, they expend two billion US dollars to settle cases between the altar boys and the bishops. That whatever they do to these young children, between the bishops and the cardinals and the nuns, the so-called nuns, they're not going to get married because Mary didn't get married. Do you see? The bishops are not going to get married because Jesus didn't get married. But yet, they are not Jesus. You have to satisfy that human, the human, you know, uh, 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 thing that Allah has indebted in you. But yet, look at what they do to the children. They become lesbians and gays and too many problems. So last year alone, the Vatican spent two billion US dollars to settle cases of molestation. That is number one, I told you. In Islam, that case, even if it exists, is negligible. It doesn't even exist. Even though if it exists, it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.01 maybe percent. So in, in, in English, we said it's negligible. It is nothing. You can't even compare it to other you know, religion. That is number one. Number two, imagine our mode of prayers. See how we make salat? We just finish salat. Imagine if I'm doing the salat and Sister Maryam is standing on my side. And Sister Habiba is on my left. And Sister Hafsa is in front of me. Imagine. Alhamdulillahi Rabbina Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin Allahu Akbar Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah You do it. Allah, he knows. And then when I say Allahu Akbar, you see, the woman have that softness when it touches me. Now I'm thinking, is she the Akbar or Allah is the Akbar? Because she's so soft, man. I can cushion. During, during you know, a tashaddu, you know, you could just incline towards them a little because they're too soft. And they could take your mind out of the prayers. Allah, he knows. He gave it the arrangement, natural arrangement. And the message of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said the best role for women in prayers is the one all the way in the back. The best role for women because they're very far from fitna from the men and the worst role the worst is the one in the front for women conversely he said the worst role for men is the one in the back because they're very close to the women and the and the best role is the one in the front and he said if you know the blessings entails those in the front you will cast you know lot you would bet to be on that same lot so this is wisdom that Allah is giving us. So Islam, Allah protected this religion. So the white man is coming to it. Then he's thinking Islam is this, Islam is that. But once he comes very close to Islam, we explain to him the Islamic concept. He never heard that before. And he began to think. And that natural you know, yearning to realize worshiping Allah comes into play. Wallahi, every one is this. Most masjid in the United States, that is when people come and accept Islam. They come in numbers with their wives and children and friends. They form a long line. On Wednesdays, it's all over the United States. Most masjid, that's the time. So we prepare for Wednesday. People accept Islam. They will just come to the masjid, knock at the door. They say, man, I want to be spiritual. There is something that is missing in my life. They speak the truth. They say there is something that is missing in their life. You don't, he said, Muslim, you pray five times a day. We don't pray at all. I'm a, I'm a Christian, but I've never gone to church for like 50 years. I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in Jesus as the Son of God. I'm a Christian, but I don't, you know, they're just nominal Christian. Jesus Christ the Lord, but they don't go to church. So they need you and I. I went to America to make money. Wallahi, in 1984. That's when I went to America. I get my visa from Kaduna. I went to America. When I went to get the visa, there's only three people waiting to get the visa. Three people. Nobody wants to go to America. Because at that time, Nigeria is higher. If you give one Naira, they give you six US dollars. That's how much I changed. So when I was going, I had $400, and I changed it times five. Imagine. Naira was great. There's no visa to go to America. But nobody go to America. They prefer to go to London, England. That's where they go. So I went to make money and come back home and live large and chill, you know? But when I went to America, 
I went looking for a job in Brooklyn. You know Brooklyn, New York City? And I went to look for the job. I couldn't get the job. Then I came outside. They told me, look, man, we're sorry. We're not hiring right now. Why don't you give us a number? We'll give you a call in about a week or two if there's a job. I said, okay, all right, it's no job. So I came outside. I was going home. Then I heard the Azan. It's a small masjid. I went there and I did my zuhur. Once I'm done doing my zuhur, the imam, you know, he rose up and he said, those of you who have never seen Sheikh Ahmed did that, he's here with us today. I was like, what? Did that? Thank God I didn't get the job. I'm happy I didn't get the job. Because Sheikh Dida is here. So he rose and he, you know, gave us 15 minutes lecture. And he left to, you know, uh, down south. After the lecture, my body begins to tell me that I've got to be like this man. So I was telling myself, this is it. I want to be a dad just like Sheikh Dida. My heart kept telling me that. I don't want nothing. I want to be like this man, subhanAllah. So when he finished, I went to him. I said, Sheikh. I want to be like you. He said, no, man, you can't be like me. I, said, man, I can't be like you. Who are you? I didn't tell him that, but I was thinking. He said, you know why I said that? He said, well, I said, I don't know. He said, you saw, uh, what's your name? I said, my name is Muhammad Awal. And he said, my name is Ahmed Hussein Didat. He said, do you know anyone by the name Ahmed Didat in this world? Do you know anyone from South Africa? I said, no. He said, well, I'm unique. Allah created me unique. There's no second army did that. And no one can be like me. And he said, you Muhammad Awal, no one can be like you. You are unique. I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be higher than me. Because if you become like me, look at my gray hair and everything, Islam will be stagnant. But if you supersede me, somebody will say, I want to be like Sheikh Muhammad Awal. And so that's how Islam grow. So from that time, after he finishes, I went, I followed him to South America. And I stayed in Durban with Didat for 10 months. And the program is one and a half years. But I was so hungry for knowledge of comparative that I, I did it within 10, 10 months. I'm done. Graduated. I came back. Then I went back again. Then I do, start doing my research. And before I know, I've reached this level that I'm delivering lectures all over the world. My intention is different. To go in, I don't have money. But I do travel a lot, and I do deliver. That's, my, that's what I do. I talk. Today, if you give me the whole of Nigeria with mountain of gold, wallahi, to give up what I'm doing, me and you will have a boxing match. I'm not going to give this up. I'm so happy doing this. People are being changed. What, what is the best? The, the, the Quran said, if you, the Hadith really, said, if you could change one person, given the alternative to become a Muslim, it is as if you make the whole world to become a Muslim. And people don't know. So why do you think the West wouldn't come for Islam? We have so many, you know, uh, lectures all over the universities and colleges. It is open. And the people are coming to Islam because Islam is so simple. A lady became a Muslim. She's a journalist. She became a Muslim. And she was interviewed. They asked her, look, you become a Muslim today. You're going to pray five times a day. That's too much. That means you can't wear no makeup. You can't wear no lipstick. Five times a day you're praying. And you are a white woman. How are you going to do that? She said, Wallahi, if I am going to be praying thousand times a day, I will do it. Why? Because I know where the prayers is going. I know it's going to Allah. But before, I don't know if it's the Holy Ghost, I'm praying to Mary, is it Jesus, or is it three of them? Or I'm, I was confused. I was just following the trend, but I didn't know exactly what was going on. So now I know my prayer is going to Allah. I am bowing down to the only one that deserves to be worshipped, and that is Allah. And then they come to us in our office, Zaytun Dawa. They said, you guys worship Allah. Allah is not the name of God. Allah is the name of the Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as God. He, he, he overthrew, you know, he make a coup and destroy all the other gods of the Quraysh and the tribe. And then he elevated his God. So he called Allah. But they forgot that in the East, you know, the Arab Christian in their Bible is Allah. They use the word Allah. They don't have any other name. And I 
told them Allah is the generic, generic name of Allah because the Hebrew, the Assyrian, the Armenians, the Arabs, and the Hebrew, they call their creator, the Hebrew call him Eleh. Some call him Eli. Some call him Eleh. Some call him El. Some call him Elohim. In Islam, we say what? Allah. So Allah, Eli, Eleh, Elohim, Allah. Jesus, who used to be, I mean, he lived in uh, Palestine. He spoke Aramaic. The language of Jesus, Aramaic. The word for the creator is Allah. It's Allah. A L A H A. Allah. In the Hebrew writing, it's Allah. So we say Allah. Because they don't know. We went to South, South America about, about three, four months ago. We go every year. We went to the Amazon, the rainforest in Amazon. There we found human beings that I've never seen human beings before. They were discovered a few months ago. Wallahi, they are human beings, but they've never seen us. They've, they've never seen a human being before in their life. They live in the jungles of the Amazon. They don't wear clothes. So they told us to bring some clothing. We went and brought, we brought a lot of clothes. We give them the clothes, they put it on, and they take it and throw it away. And they come and touch us. They, they're just laughing at us because we have clothes on. Then I went and hide behind a tree. And I bowed down in prostration to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ni'ima that I'm a Muslim. And look at these people. They've never known anything about Islam. Nobody have contact with them. So the Ministry of Indian Preservation in Brazil protected them. They wouldn't even allow us to take a picture because people use them, taking picture to the, you know, to part of the world and they make money off them. Say, no, we don't make money off them. We just want to build them Islam. So we hired people that speak their native language and we live in that jungle for 10 days trying to convince them and give them Islam, which Alhamdulillah, the second in command leader of that community, he accepted Islam. So when we take Islam, we leave ten, two people with them and we went to the next village. And I was told for the past four years doing this, we have over 500 inhabitants of the Amazon who are Muslims today. Otherwise, they've never seen a Muslim in their life. So Allah said, Most of mankind do not know. But intellectuals are writing books about Islam. Intellectuals. Those who study the world. Those who, they like world commentary. They make comment on the world. Intellectuals, free thinkers, you know, behaviorists, human scientists. They are writing books today and they're saying that Islam is a natural religion. Amongst them is George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw is a British man. He wrote a book in 1886 and he called the book's name The Genuine Islam. He's not a Christian, but he's a, you know, a white guy. Not a Christian. He doesn't believe in any religion. But he studied Islam and he named that book The Genuine Islam. Now in that book, George Bernard Shaw said, I predict within the next 200 years, England must accept Islam. Nay, Europe. He predicted in 200 years, he said, Wallahi, England must accept Islam because it is a natural religion. It is inkling with nature. See, he's a scientist. He's not a Muslim, but he's telling people to take Islam. That will solve their problem. Then he commented. He said, with our sociologists, with our social scientists, with our psychologists and psychiatrists and intellectuals, we couldn't solve the problem of alcohol. Alcoholism is a serious problem in the West. People are waiting for their children to get to 16 years so that they will buy them the first bottle of champagne. Now they're going to win them to drink champagne. You have to have a legal age. 16, they call it sweet 16. So in the weekends in America, it's a lot of accidents all over the state. Young people have an accident because they drink. So this man in his book, The Genuine Islam, George Bernard Shaw, he said the problem that he, 
we couldn't solve, the West could not solve, have been solved by the Arabian prophet over 1,400 years ago in the desert. And he quoted the Quranic word, one word. to mean he quoted this verse. He said, look at the verse that changed the Arab dynamics. He said, from that day, wine was destroyed in Makkah Street in Medina, never to be filled again. People going from house to house, revelation have come down, no more drinking. Really? They boggle it down. You're talking about miracle? This is the miracle. Without any miracle, Muhammad transformed nations. Without any miracle, which miracle? This is the miracle. No physical miracle, fine. But look at the people. He said, look at the Muslim. Then, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, the leader of Indian, whatever, freedom, in his book, The Young India, he said, the more I read the biography of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more I am convinced that Islam did not spread by the sword. It spread by the natural, basic instinct embedded in the Quran, which is akin to the nature of man. He said, these are the only things that make people to bow down to the God they call Allah and to reform the people. He said, Muhammad couldn't have done all these things. By himself, he couldn't have done it. He said, when I was reading the book, the minute I get to the last chapter, in the last paragraph, in the last line, I became so sad. Why? Because there was no more to read about this beautiful soul in the Arabian desert. Why are they glorifying Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Allah said, Wa inna kada ala khulqul azim. Thou, O Muhammad, we have raised you to the highest level. Haven't we? We have esteemed you on the tongue of men. They will pronounce you, O Muhammad. As we sit right now, some nation somewhere, a shadow anna Muhammad is a 24 hours thing until the end of time. His name is perpetually mentioned every second. As you sleep, some nation is Zuhur or Asad. It's a continuous. Who knows Abu Jahl? Who knows Uqba? Who knows them? Nobody mentioned them. But Muhammad's name is still. So this. He said in his book, The Young India, he said, this is what makes Islam whatever he is. And he went on to say, Muhammad has all the natural forces behind him, but he never used it. He's a simple man. He said, Muhammad is a father. He's an uncle. He's a brother. He's an ordinary man. He said, Muhammad is a military man. Muhammad is a dictator, he said. He said, Muhammad is a prophet and a messenger. But he's a prophet and a messenger without any standing army. If Muhammad moved, he moved men. He moved thinkers. He moved gods. He said, this is the legacy of Muhammad of Arabia. But the missionary have done damage to his esteemed name. Saying that with the Quran in his right hand, the sword on his left hand, he destroyed mankind. That's why they become Muslim. And he said, this is the most fantastic lie they can ever say to Muhammad. He said, if Muhammad used sword, he himself would have been killed in Mecca and Medina, and Islam would never be known. He said, indeed, he used sword, but the sword of intellect. Invite them all to the way of Allah with wisdom and beautiful speeches. Beautiful speeches. And argue with them on ways that are gracious. You don't argue with them. You go, to, you go to hell because you worship Jesus. No, we don't do that. You present Islam. We have all the answers. So the West is coming to, towards Islam. I don't know. Some of you might have heard something that happened to me last month or last two weeks. If you know that, raise your hand. Let me see. What, what did they say about me? You've read about me, right? You read about me? All right. Some of you have read, some didn't know. When I was coming from the United States, I was coming to Africa about three weeks ago. And there was, there was a guy, 
a black American who became a Muslim through us, you know, he became a Muslim. So he said his wife got a baby and he wanted us to um, go and do the naming ceremony. So we went to do the naming ceremony. And the way coming home, we was in the car and we saw the, you know, the cops. They stopped us and asking a few questions and they asked us to come out. So we came out and they asked an ID card, gave ID card and everything, they look and they look at me and they ask the other guys, okay, you guys go inside the car and, uh, and go. And they say, you, Mr. Mohammed Awo, you come with us. I say, why? They say, we have a lunch with you. I, mean, I don't want to eat no lunch with you. I don't want a lunch with you, I'm going home. I don't want no lunch, I want to go home. They said no, so they took me and they asked me a few questions. And the first question was, why is it that you're trying to American, Islamatize America? They said, why? Just tell us, why are you trying to Islamatize America? I said, I don't do that. I never Islamatize nobody, but I'm, I'm a Muslim evangelist. That's what I am. You have a Christian evangelist, I'm a Muslim evangelist. Unfortunately, I'm a Muslim evangelist. And so I have the right within American Constitution to propagate my mission and my religion. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't make a single human being to become a Muslim. It is up to Allah. Mine is to present Islam. It's okay, fine. But do you work? I say, well, that's my job. He said, but how come you travel? Because we noticed for the past two months, you've been to about 25 different cities in America. And all of this, you fly. You was in the air. You just take a plane. You go here and there. Who is sponsoring you? Who is your sponsor? Tell us. How do you do that? I say, I don't, I don't have a sponsor. I wish I had a sponsor, but I don't have a sponsor. I need to travel by air. I say, because anyone that wants my service, he gives me a call. And he buys me a ticket. He gives me a place to sleep and a food to eat. And I come and do my job. That's why I fly. I can't walk from here to Libya. I've got to fly, right? He say, yeah. It's all right. The next question is, um, we want to have access to your computers. So okay, no problem. I've got nothing to hide. Went home, opened my room. They took my laptop, my desktop, my iPad, everything. What are they looking for? To see if I have any hidden agenda. There's any group that I belong to that back me up. I said, look, what are you, why are you doing this? I've been in America over 30 years. My children are 30 years and above in America. I never destroy America today, now that I look so old. What am I going to do to destroy America? Come on, man. But if you go, I promise you, I promise you 99.99% you will never find nothing about me. Because I don't curse America. I bless America. I never curse America in my life. In fact, I don't want to see people curse in America because we live in America. We got Muslims, millions in America. So why should we curse America? We have masjid. Our children live there. And we are doing da'wah. So why should we curse America? The messenger didn't curse Makkah and Medina. In fact, he prayed for them. In Taif, they were trying to destroy him. The angel came down. What do you want, Muhammad? Allah asked me to, to, to push the stone, destroy all Taif. The messenger said, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Allah, don't do that to them. You know, if they didn't do the salat or they didn't accept Islam, maybe their children will accept Islam. So Allah, your name is Rahma, mercy. I love them. And look at Taif today. So I'm doing or we are doing the same thing to America. I believe within a few years to come, because that's what they projected by the year 2051, Pew Foundation, an organization in America, this is a empirical evidence. They say by the year 2051, half of Europe is going to be Islam. Without any bloodshed. They say it is coming. And number one, the Muslims are busy doing propagation. The masjid is filling up. They are buying churches. Number three, our children have followed free thinkers. They become atheists because our, our deeds, our deeds, look at us. We don't give them nothing spiritually. So the Muslims are coming. And 50,000 Muslims came, last two years, 50,000 Muslims came to two, two countries in Europe. 
these 50,000 people are on to marry the Western women, maybe convert them to Islam, and they have, uh, they're going to have children that are Muslims, and Islam is taken up. Allah have his way. Allah's way is different to propagate the Ummah, to propagate the world to become Muslims. Allah's way is different. Ours is to present the case. Allah, he have a way. Whatever you're thinking that is bad for you, it could be or might be good for you. And whatever you think is bad, it could be good. So when I was in the stage, Trump became a president, people were angry. Wallahi, there's a reason for that. Now in America, people want to know about Islam because of what Trump is doing. Now they come to the church, I mean to the masjid. They want the Quran to see why is the Muslim trying to destroy America? Why are you doing bombs, suicide bombers? Why? So they come to the masjid, they want to see the mind of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and that's the Quran. Once they read that, they have few questions. Once we answer it, the next thing is, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. So had Trump didn't make those statements, they wouldn't have known. There is a man in Europe by the name of Maurice Bukai. You have read about him, Maurice Bukai. He wrote a book, the Quran, the Bible, and science. Maurice Bukai used to be an agnostic. An agnostic is someone that believed that God created this world, but he removed himself away and he leave us to fend for ourselves. That's agnosticism. He used to be one of them in France. He belonged to the Paris club. So the rate at which the Muslims are rising in France, everybody's becoming a Muslim. Today in America, wallahi, to be a Muslim is a new thing. It's a style. They see a Muslim, Salam Alaikum, brother man. Salam Alaikum, La Wakbar. Salam Alaikum. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Salam Alaikum, brother. They hug you. It's like a new thing. You know, you got a Muslim, you got a hat on, Allahu Akbar, you know? It's a new, it's, it's just something. Who does that if not Allah? Who does that? You see them walking down the street with their kufi on, you know, but they are not Muslims. So, yo, man, when you become a Muslim, you gotta do some salat. Yo, shit, man, I, I smoke a lot of weed, man, you uh, know? Just waiting for the right time, you know. It's like, man, ain't no right time. You, the time is now, man. You never know when you're gonna die. Today, tomorrow, whatever. So just take Islam. I said, look, be a Muslim and smoke your rifa. What's wrong with that? Just be a Muslim now. Smoke your rifa. Yeah. Eventually, you're gonna see. Inna salata kanat alal muminin kitabun maqouta. Allah said, once you accept Islam itself. Islam will make you stop all these things. You will stop once you begin to... That's what we do in America. The system, the way we present Islam in America is different from here. Certain things we do to accept, to, to propagate Islam is different here. You can do the same thing here because we are all Muslims. If you tell a white man, the Quran is from Allah, he says, man, you're crazy. <laughs> what? Do you drink a wine or something? I said, no. <laughs> this Quran is from God. Man, what's wrong with you? Maybe something's loose up here or something. The angel came down. Man, you mean the angel came down physical to give Muhammad the Quran? He doesn't believe that. You know what he wants? He wants to touch it. He wants to see. Take it to the laboratory. Analyze it. Hatta yatabayyana lahum annahul haqq. That's what they think. They want to see, touch, examine, cross-examine, and ask. Then they believe. Because you and I, the Quran came, we believe. No question. Muhammad, Messenger of Allah, we believe. But they, they don't, they're not going to believe like that. Because they reason, they think, they, 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 they analyze information. They believe in analysis. So Maurice Bukhail, in France, was given 50 million francs to write a book and condemn Islam. They asked him to write a book about Islam and condemn Islam. He said, look, all right, I'm going to do it, but I want the Quran. So they gave him the Quran in France, in the French language. He read the Quran in French. He said, no, I've got to understand the Arabic language. You know what he did? A scientist. He took the Quran in Arabic. 
read the English book. So he went to Yemen. He stayed in Yemen for three years. He studied the Yemeni Arabic dialect. Then he came to Egypt for two years. He studied the Arabic dialect in Egypt. Then he came to, he went to five different, he spent 10 years. Out of the 10 years, eight years researching the Arabic language. You see how they think? Once he's done, it took him two years to cross-examine the Quran. Wallahi, once Maurice Bukhari was done, he came to France. There's a place called Marseille. Is it Marseille? Marseille. So that's where they have the head of the Paris club. These are scientists, intellectuals, but they don't believe in Allah that much. But they don't like the way Islam is taking shape. So they say for him to write a book and condemn Islam because he's one of the best minds in Europe. If he say Islam is terrible, they will accept. So he, it's okay. Two years he wrote about whatever he researched on Islam. So he came back to the Paris club like this, and they were sitting down, and he said, I've got so many data on the work that you gave it, me to do. He said, before I tell you what I've collected about Islam, I will say this to you. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Wallahi. But it's because he became a Muslim in front of his own people. They get angry. You know how they do? They were angry. He said, wait, wait, wait. Who are you? You're a scientist, right? They say, yeah, I'm a scientist too. But I've got the chance. For 10 years, I have meticulously analyzed the Quran from step by step. Everything is done. I'm done. Believe me. No human being will be able to write a book like the Quran in the seventh century. Impossible. He said, not Muhammad, not the Sahaba, none. You can't write the information in the Quran. He said, for anyone to write a book like the Quran, that person has to have an encyclopedic mind. How are you going to get it up to the body mind? He said, for anyone to write a book like the Quran, that person has to have an encyclopedic mind, which is impossible. Because the information in the Quran is beyond the seventh century. It is beyond seventh century. He said, the Quran is such that if it, the Quran pass away, pass around you, you have to go and have a look at second thought. He said, Muhammad couldn't read the Quran. And I'm a scientist. And you trust me. You believe in me. And I've analyzed the Quran. Believe me. He didn't write the book. So they asked him, who wrote the Quran? He said, I believe Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and the Prophet, they came from the same school. Wallahi, Maurice Bikal. So his social science people, they cut him off. They cut him off. They took away his lances. Then he wrote another book. The Genesis of Man. That where did man come from? You should get that book. Go on the net, Google Maurice Bukayel, the books of Maurice Bukayel. Just cook. But you, be, you will read that book and you will be crying. The information. This man is intellectual. So Allah said, وَيَرَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا لِإِلِمْ أَلَّذِي أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ هُوَ الْحَقِّ وَيَحَدِي إِلَى سُرَعَ الْعَزِيزِ الْخَمِيدِ Those who are knowledgeable, O Muhammad, they will come eventually and they will know that you are on the right track and that it is Allah who sent you. Knowledge! Yarfa illahu allazina amanu minkum wal lazina utul ilim darajat. Those amongst you with iman, Allah will give you a position. But men of knowledge, darajat. A degree above everything. Knowledge is power. So, by virtue of knowledge, the West is coming to Islam. Step by step by step by step and there is every reason that in a few years Islam will engulf the West there is no doubt I went to Alaska you know Alaska in America it's cold very cold when we sleep in Alaska because of the cold we take the flight from from Seattle Washington we land in Anchorage then we take 
another plane, small plane, to the interior you know, of the snow area. We're going to go give lecture about Islam. Once we get there, we take a snowmobile. Snowmobile is sort of like, it's like a, you know, automobile, but it's meant for the snow. We go there, we've seen a masjid built with ice. Wallahi. Masjid. There's no concrete, no wood, no, uh, no, um, there's no wood, no concrete, and no nail. It's just ice. Big masjid. They cut the ice. Pacific Ocean, they cut the ice with machine, Grrr, cut it thick, they deck it like this, they make a masjid, they make a mambar, ice. The, the miracle is that inside the masjid, the temperature is constant. I was crying, man. But outside, it's cold. Before we go to sleep, we have to get inside a chute. We enter inside a chute. You know, and we zip ourselves and we plug it to the plug for 45 minutes so we get insulated. This is how cold Alaska. If I touch your ears like this, you're not going to feel them. You will know. Because if you spit, by the time it falls to the ground, it has become ice. That's Alaska. We're supposed to be there for like a week, but we stay two days and run away quickly <laughs> to Seattle. But even in that mist, if the Imam is giving salat, wallah, you will cry. A lot of mistakes. Alhamdulillah, hula, bilal, man, arrahman. I was sleeping. So I listened. I was in the back. I said, go ahead. He gives a lot. He said, shake. He's the imam of that village. But the, 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 the fatiha is there. La salat, liman lam yakara al, fatiha tul kitab. Salat cannot sustain without fatiha. But this guy is doing the fatiha upside down. And I told him, I said, look. I believe in my heart that every mistake you made, Allah will double your reward. With every mistake you make in this terrain, in this wilderness of snow, no human beings, no tree, you are struggling. That's what Allah likes. So when you struggle and you fall, rise up again. You commit sin, you commit wrong, rise up and keep going. Allah will say, oh, look at my servant. He realized his mistake, he's up and going. I am Gafur Rahim, I forgive you, man. That's Allah. He forgive and forget and he never write it down. He look at your sincere effort. You just keep on falling. You fall. You are, you are created weak. We. So you fall, you rise. So I gave him hope. And we stay. Again, we came back and we taught the children how to recite Fatiha and Ula Uzain. That's it. It's like you've given them a billion dollars. The children were reciting Fatiha. The whole nation, the whole village where they were jumping and jubilating because their children could recite Fatiha. But look at how many Qurans we have here. We don't even take advantage. See, the the, the Shayyukhs are here. Nigeria is the, is the epitome of knowledge. Even the Saudis, they shy away from Nigeria. When it comes to natural knowledge Allah has given them, this is true all over the world. We know. They know Nigeria. So we should take advantage. I wish I could go back in time and I would do more research about Islam. My is Islam, this is my first lecture. I just came back right now. I took two, two planes. I'm so tired. I'm starving. I'm hungry. I got a headache. But when it comes to delivering, I like to talk. If you don't stop me, if he didn't stop me up, because I'm going to talk till that kingdom come. <laughs> That's my job. That's my life. Khaza wa billahi tawfiq wa akhiru da'awan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.